Welcome to the League of Nerds comic book segment number 114. I'm John Cooney here to talk to you about comics being released the 2nd of April 2014, beginning as usual with my first five, meaning these are the first five books I intend to read this week, and I'll give you some more depth on them, starting with at number one, Ultimate Comics Spider-Man number 200. The world mourns on the anniversary of Peter Parker's death. A gathering of Spidey's friends and foes reveals some shocking truths about Peter and his world, one of the biggest surprise endings of the year. Artist David Marquez described his feelings about working on this issue. Quote, It's crazy. This is a book that I read in college. I started reading Ultimate Spider-Man with issue number one back in 2000. So now getting to work with Brian on the 200th anniversary issue is more than a dream come true. There's so much meaning to it. It's getting to commemorate a book that meant a whole lot to me as a reader, and even more to me as a creator, being the regular artist on a book with such longevity as this. Then getting to do a split cover with the book's original artist Mark Bagley was incredible. Getting to know Mark and Brian has been awesome because on one hand you kind of never want to meet your heroes because you're afraid they might be dicks or you lose something. But Mark and Brian are great people and getting to collaborate with them on their baby has meant a whole lot. Close quote. He went on to say what he enjoys about working with Brian Michael Bendis. Quote, I think it's two main things. He and I have a lot of similar sensibilities when it comes to storytelling. We enjoy emotional, character-driven stories. While I'm drawing, I really get into making my characters emotive. Brian's dialogue and his stories help me elevate that to a higher level. In addition to the emotion, there's some great action. You get a balance with stories playing off quiet, intimate scenes and then big, dramatic explosions destroying all of the New Jersey coastline. He also pushes me to draw stuff that I normally wouldn't tend to do on my own. He's a writer that writes to his artists and not just their comfort zones. He pushes me and challenges me to do things differently than I have before, or to draw things that I might not want to draw, which is important for the growth of any artist. He's a great collaborator. Close quote. At number two, we have Invincible Universe number 12, King Lizard's plan has been unleashed and split the Guardians in two. When the smoke clears, will anyone be left to save the day? Series writer Phil Hester explained what it's like to work with artist Todd Nayak. Quote, I've gone from appreciative fan to odd collaborator. I always knew he was good, but when I see the layouts he sends back in response to my scripts, I'm floored. I've given him some fairly impossible shots to portray, and he belts them out with astounding ease. It's galling to tell the truth. As an artist, I look on what he does with simple jealousy. Hell, I bet we could sell this book with all the word balloons whited out. This is the kind of book Todd was born to draw. Close quote. At number three, we have Inhuman number one. The newest superheroes in the Marvel Universe are born. A cloud of Terrigen mists is moving around the world, turning regular people into Inhumans with amazing powers. But not everyone thinks this is a good thing. Discover the secret history of the Marvel Universe and get in at the ground floor of the next big Marvel franchise. Series writer Charles Soule shared what it was like taking on the Inhumans. Quote, you're adding to this deep, dense mythology. Specifically, with respect to the Inhumans, they're almost a mythological creation in and of themselves. The way they work, the way they operate, the fact that they're royalty. And they've always been involved with a lot of big cosmos events that Marvel has done. So typically, they've typically been seen in that vein. As a royal family who appears as part of big, huge Marvel events or cosmic stories, that sort of thing. And this lets us do a lot more with the concepts and do some really interesting things. The Inhumans, just as an idea, the idea that you were an ordinary horseman until you were exposed to this callus that is a very rare element, is a neat idea in and of itself. Then taking it into the Inhuman series, well, that almost becomes a random thing. You could be someone walking along the streets of New York City, if you're in New York City, and then the next thing you know, a cloud comes and your life is changed forever. I think it's fascinating. It lets me play with both sides of the Inhuman equation, which is the high-level royal family stuff as well as the street-level approach to the Inhumans, which I don't think we've ever seen before. Close quote. At number four, we've got Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy Prelude number one of two. Get ready for Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy with an all-new comic book prelude written by comics legends Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning, who is Nebula. What tragic events forged her unbreakable allegiance to her Dark Lord? Find out here, plus Gamora, Korath, and more from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Series writers and longtime collaborators Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning, who had recently split from working together but reunited for this project, shared their thoughts on it. Said Abnett, quote, Issue number one is pretty much an origin, or at least background story for Nebula, which reveals details of her upbringing and training. This features Gamora and Thanos, and is packed full of action too. It's a chance for fans to know a little bit more about Nebula prior to the film's release. Close quote. He went on to tell what it was like writing for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Quote, 
The characters of the Prelude comic had to fit very cleanly into the movie version, so there wasn't quite the same opportunity for madcap invention. But they were very enjoyable to write nevertheless, and I think people will like the end results. Though the movie does an excellent job of realizing these characters, just as the other Marvel movies do, they are nevertheless the movie versions, and I had to make sure the tone fitted precisely. Of course, I'm used to working within the parameters of any license, and find that the creative limits are often very liberating in terms of my invention within that framework. Close quote. Lanning added, quote, There's a definite distinction between the Marvel Comics universe and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The films have to stand on their own. They have very different agenda and have to tell their own story, which is now developed into a very rich continuity based in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. What Marvel have done, which makes them stand out above their rivals, is use brilliant directors and writers who have the love and respect for the comic book source material. This made telling the tie-in stories very easy to do because these characters are not so distant to their comic counterparts as to be unrecognizable. They're more like an alternate version similar to what the Ultimate Universe did. Close quote. And at number 5 we have Trillium, number 8 of 8. What is Nika's ultimate destiny? And what role will William play in the survival of humankind? Can they finally be reunited before the universe unravels around them? Vertigo's sci-fi epic reaches its mind-bending conclusion. Series writer and artist Jeff Lemire spoke about the conclusion of the series, quote, This story, specifically, is about the end of the universe, so there is an end, and the end is pretty immediate. Sometimes it's good to have a clear ending in your mind. You never know with an ongoing series how long they'll last or what their readership is going to be like. You're taking a risk by building a world and launching a series and not knowing for sure whether you get to tell the story you want to tell all the way through. With a series like this, I knew I could tell a beginning, a middle, and an end exactly the way I wanted. Close quote. Rounding out the top ten at number six, we've got Moon Knight number two. The best new comic of 2014 continues with the story that has to be experienced to be believed. At number seven, we have The New Warriors number three. The kids are all fight. The all-new Nova has tea with the High Evolutionary as a worldwide genocide approaches. Why does the High Evolutionary want to kill anything that's not human? Is he a hero or a villain? The answers are here. Plus, as the new warriors gather in New York, a captured Scarlet Spider meets Nova, and one of them really annoys the other. Guess. At number 8, we've got Black Widow number 5, Paris, London, Montenegro. Natasha is in a race against time under the shadow of the hammer. A dark plot threatens Europe, and even S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't know who's behind it. With nowhere to turn for answers, Natasha has no choice but to ask the Raven for help. At number 9, we've got Magneto number 2. Horrors from Magneto's past inform his decisions in the present as he hunts down the source of the newest threat to mutant kind. Meanwhile, S.H.I.E.L.D. catches a glimpse of Magneto's new band of followers. And at number 10, we have Loki, Agent of Asgard number 3. Loki heads back to the dawn of Asgard to join its greatest heroes on a quest for an otter skin of gold, the heart's blood of a dragon, and a certain magical sword. Meanwhile, Loki does not appear in this issue. Both of these statements are, for once, true. For the best of the rest, from DC Comics, we have Action Comics number 30. Following the events of Forever Evil, Superman confronts Lex Luthor, but the world is turned around for these two. The hero has become the villain, and the villain the hero is forces beyond these two gather to destroy the Man of Steel, beginning with the dormant Doomsday who has crossed over from the Phantom Zone. Next, we have Aquaman and the others number 1. A future's end prelude, spinning out of Aquaman, the king of Atlantis and his teammates find themselves targeted by an unknown foe that wants their Atlantean artifacts. Don't miss the start of this all-new series. We've also got Detective Comics number 30. A bold new direction for Detective Comics is the Flash creative team of Francis Manipul and Brian Buccoletto take over the creative reins. Batman finds himself knee-deep in a new mystery involving a deadly new narcotic that has hit the streets of Gotham City. And we have Trinity of Sin, the Phantom Stranger number 18, the crack in creation begins. Sin Eater and his new master, the mysterious Non, are marshalling an army of these in-betweener souls. Their goal? To invade the world of the living and set up a new order. Guest starring Superman and Dr. Light, who is still dead. From Marvel Comics, we've got Amazing Spider-Man Family Business hardcover. Someone has Spider-Man in their crosshairs, and the only person in the Marvel Universe who can save him is Peter Parker's sister? As the web slinger meets family he never knew, will she end up becoming his greatest ally, or the one who damns him? And what does the kingpin of crime have to do with it? 
This all-new original graphic novel, written by Eisner Award winner Mark Wade of Daredevil and acclaimed author James Robinson of Superman, and fully painted by the legendary Gabrielle Delato of Secret War, comes to you in a high-end oversized format. It's the web slinger's darkest hour and greatest triumph. Next we have Deadpool vs. Carnage number 1 of 4, two red-suited madmen for the price of one. That's right, good crazy vs. bad crazy once and for all, and you can bet it's going to be a bloody one. We've also got The Punisher number 4, the Punisher captured by Dos Souls gang is caught in the metaphorical lion's den. Tough luck, metaphorical lions. The 131 get the call, take down the Punisher with extreme prejudice. A new player tosses her hat in the ring, and Frank's got to ask himself a question, do I feel lucky? Well, do you, Frank? Next, we have She-Hulk number 3, We the People Find You Doom. When the son of Victor Von Doom seeks extradition, Jen Walters will go to the ends of the earth for justice. All this and Matt Murdock, too, as Charles Soule of Thunderbolts and Javier Polito of Hawkeye continue 2014 sleeper hit. And we have What If Age of Ultron number 1 of 5, The Endless Age of Ultron. In Age of Ultron, a time-traveling Wolverine killed Hank Pym before he could create the world-conquering Ultron. What would the Marvel Universe look like if another founding Avenger had been killed instead? A world without the Wasp brings a world where Hank Pym created an Ultron even more heinous than the one we know. From Dark Horse Comics, we've got Terminator Salvation, the final battle number 5 of 12. John Connor's assault on Skynet is met with a devastating counterattack. Controlled by a human serial killer with no loyalty to mankind, the Terminator's deadly mechanical efficiency is now matched with the creativity and pleasure for killing of a murderous psychopath. From Dynamite Entertainment, we have Turok Dinosaur Hunter number 3. As dinosaur carnage spreads across the land, Turok and Andar face an even more dangerous enemy, a fangless, scaleless monstrosity that's more ruthless than any other creature on the planet. How will Turok face the onslaught of this new world of horror? Greg Pak and Mirko Kolak bring you an amazing Turok tale you've never experienced. From Image Comics, we've got Apocalypse Owl number 3 of 4. The life of private investigator Allison Carter is complicated enough just preventing the end of the world on a regular basis, but in the midst of her latest case, she gets an unexpected call from her mostly dead ex-boyfriend, who has a tip that may prove helpful or push the world further towards its destruction. Along the way, she encounters a closet troll with a stun gun fetish, a theme park filled with demonic creatures in happy costumes, and unravels a secret that will change her life forever. Next, we have Sidekick number 6. For years, Barry Flyboy Chase has carried the grief and belief that his mentor, the Red Cow, was dead, and the guilt that he could have prevented it. Now Julia Moonglow provides all the proof he needs to know that the Red Cow is alive and well, somewhere. Now comes the task of finding him, and more important still, exacting their revenge. And we have Starlight number 2. Duke McQueen once saved an alien world from destruction, but it happened in a place nobody believes in during a time nobody remembers. Surrounded by memories of his late wife and his happier past, Duke stays as a hero or long gone, or so he thinks. Now a young visitor from the world Duke once saved is coming to him with a desperate plea for help. It's one last chance at adventure for Duke and another chapter to unfold in the ever-expanding Miller World universe. Out in trades, we've got Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 Cosmic Avengers trade paperback. There's a new rule in the galaxy, no one touches Earth. But why has Earth suddenly become the most important planet in the galaxy? That's what the Guardians of the Galaxy are going to find out. Join Star-Lord, Gamora, Drax, Rocket Raccoon, Groot, and wait for it, the Invincible Iron Man, as they embark upon one of the most explosive and eye-opening chapters of Marvel now. The secrets these galactic Avengers discover will rattle Marvel readers for years to come. But while London deals with a brutal invasion by the Badoon, the fate of the Guardians may have already been decided millions of miles away. Why wait for the movie? It all starts here. Collecting Guardians of the Galaxy number 0.1 and 1 through 3, and Guardians of the Galaxy Tomorrow's Avengers number 1. And we have Superior Spider-Man Volume 2 hardcover. The exploits of Otto Octavius, the superior Spider-Man, continue. As the Avengers threaten to kick Spidey off the team for his recent violent actions, Peter Parker's ghostly revenant fights to regain control of his body, his mind, and his destiny. Who will live, who will die, and who will emerge as the one true superior Spider-Man? And when the Green Goblin returns, why is Spidey nowhere to be found? Then, when the raft shuts down, Spidey is trapped inside with J. Jonah Jameson, Glory, Nora, and practically all the villains the superior Spider-Man has brutalized during his short career. Now it's payback time. 
plus Jester, Screwball, Cardiac, Shadowland, The Tinkerer, quite possibly the final days of the Hobgoblin, and the return of a Spider-Man who hasn't been seen for some time, meaning centuries. Collecting Superior Spider-Man number 6 through 16. Okay, so that's just a few of my favorite books out this week. There's still plenty of others available, and I broke out all the Marvel titles this week in their own video, as well as a separate video for all of DC, and even a video with the top independent publishers, and you can find them all on my YouTube channel at he's got issues.com. And we'll also have links up on the League of Nerds.com, our Facebook page, so be sure to like us there too. And of course, you can follow everything I'm reading on Facebook, Pinterest, Tumblr, or Twitter. You can find links to everything in the About section at He's Got Issues.com. And a reminder that both He's Got Issues and the League of Nerds are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network. So until next week, I'm John Cooney, and I've got issues. <laughs>